Welcome everybody to DeBakey CV Live, deep in the heart of Texas, coming to you from Houston, Texas. Methodist DeBakey Heart and Vascular Center. We're in the studios today and we have a special show for you. I think you're really going to enjoy this. It's something a little different. As you know, I like to do things a little different. I'm Dr. Randall Wolf. I'm your host. Our guest will be Dr. Efrain Miranda, and I'll be introducing him in a couple of minutes. <clears throat> we talk about atrial fibrillation. This particular session is going to be about a deep dive into the autonomic control of the heart. And we believe that there will be a renaissance of the autonomic control of the heart. It's been somewhat forgotten for the last 40 years, but we think it's going to come back and it's very important for AFib. Uh, patients often say, Doc, do you think I have vago AFib? Well, I think most lone AFib is vago AFib or mediated by vago, and we'll also talk about the sympathetic system. So this is very important, and when you want to advance an area in medicine, the first thing you have to go is look at the go-to is the anatomy and then the physiology. This is so important, something we forget, and may also explain why certain things work in clinical medicine and certain things don't work. So disregard of the anatomy is a grave mistake. We'll put you on the right path to the anatomy of the heart and the autonomic system in the next 45 minutes. <clears throat> We're gonna put up a screen that will show you how to get your questions to us. Dr. Miranda and I will answer your questions this next 45 minutes. If you're on your phone, Go to 37607, and in the little box, type in DeBakey, and you can ask your question. And I encourage you to ask your questions early on in this session. Don't wait till the end. We already have three questions coming in, so that's good. If you're on your computer, the second way is to go to poll, P-O-L-L-E-V dot com, enter DeBakey, respond to the activity. So you have a couple different ways to ask us questions. <clears throat> if you get your questions in, we will attempt to answer all questions. Now, um, a deep dive into the autonomics would be, uh, I'd be amiss if Dr. Miranda wasn't involved. I actually wanted to do this talk last month, but Dr. Miranda was uh, lecturing in Germany at the time. So we, way we did Q&A with uh, Sandy Schreemeyer waited for a frame to come back. Uh, Dr. Miranda is clinical uh, associate professor of clinical anatomy at the University of Cincinnati. He is the president and founder of clinicalanatomy.com. You can look it up, clinicalanatomy.com. Producers may even flash that on the screen for you. There it is. It's a very interesting site. <clears throat> it's, it's not only... Uh, up to date, but it also has a lot of really cool historical facts about anatomy. So if you really want some entertainment some evening, go to clinicalanatomy.com and look at Dr. Miranda's site. Uh, Dr. Miranda does work for a lot of industry, uh, and including Atricure, which is a company that supplies a lot of the products that I use in the operating room. He's responsible for, responsible for training engineers uh, for training uh, people in the field, companies like Medtronic and Atricure and Valley Lab and others. <clears throat> we started talking about the autonomics of the heart, and uh, I really uh, got an education with Dr. Miranda. It took me back to all the ways these things interact. And really, the best way for you to understand this is to have Dr. Miranda start out this, this uh, lecture, if you will. But we will interrupt it. We'll interrupt it for your questions. We'll interrupt it from time to time. We think it's a jumping off spot for some clinical point. And uh, just to start out, before I start with Dr. Miranda, I want to answer one question that's the first one that came in. What is the likelihood of a second compensatory pause one year post-op? There were no symptoms associated with the first pause, thanks. Well, compensatory pause is usually when the heart goes out of rhythm, could be briefly. Usually in AFib, <clears throat> it's a brief run of eight flutter 
or supraventricular tachycardia. And the heart's normal way to stop this is sort of like it, it's its own cardioversion. It takes a pause. It shuts everything down and starts over. That's what a pause is. So a compensatory pause is a pause that's initiated by your own pacemaker system to shut down. It's like hitting the reset button on your computer. Uh, so it's normal. And if it's a four, five, six, seven pause, six, seven second pause, that's okay. <clears throat> that's normally what the heart will do. So I just wanted to answer that uh, off the bat. Um, Dr. Miranda, thanks for joining us. I'm really excited about this lecture because I learned a lot from your talk on this. So uh, I know you're back in your uh, library in Cincinnati. I see the backdrop there. And that's not a fake backdrop, is it? That's the real one, isn't it? Yeah, it is. <laughs> Welcome to uh, CV Live, DeBakey. Thanks for the, inv for the invitation. And um, just want to remind everybody that's attending that we... This is, I think, the third time we we get together. <clears throat> so they are in your website and over at CV um, at CV Live, the Vake CV Live. There's a couple other uh, presentations that uh, conversations that we've done, and um, those kind of are, are the basis for what we're going to discuss today. So, tell me, um, are you want to go straight into the presentation? Let, what do yeah, you, what let's, should we screen share and let you get started? All and, right, and let me let me share my okay? screen. Let's see Tyree, if... his voice okay? Okay. All right, let's see. Is how does that look? You want it? Does it need to be bigger? Or are you okay? Yeah, you go ahead and start, and they'll work on it. All right. All right. So um, <clears throat> the topic today is uh, a deep dive into the vagus and the autonomic control of the heart rhythm. And um, it, is in, it is a complex mechanism. And what I would like to do is start with an analogy. Uh, because it, analogies makes everything easy. So we have a computer, a cable, and let's say a printer. And this is, these are elements that are, one is the control center, the computer. The cable connects these two elements. And the printer is the effector, the, act, the, the item that's activated. Well, this is quite similar to what happens in the nervous system with one caveat. In the nervous system, the control center and the connector are one unit. And this is what we call a neuron. A neuron is composed, and this is one of billions of neurons in our body, um, composed, composed of a body and an axon. What's interesting is that when you have a group of neurons in the body, we call that a ganglion. The plural form is ganglia. And we have a group of axons, we call that a nerve. So. This is the control center and connector, the neuron of the, of the body. Now, in the uh, Facebook group, there's always a question, is can a nerve regrow back after surgery? And this is a very important question because I know that you are going in and ablating the ganglionated, ganglionated plexi. And these are nerves, so can they regrow? Well, it, it's, it's a question that needs two answers. Number one, if you destroy, ablate, coagulate, if you destroy the, the control center, everything dies and there's no recuperation. But if you ablate the nerve, there is a possibility of this nerve to regrow. Now, if you do the ablation with a scar, which is what the uh, Wolf Mini makes us, then this wall of scar will not allow for the growth. And we discussed this in uh, November last year 
and this is just a, a slide of that presentation, where if you do a complete ablation, a transmure ablation from the endocardium through the myocardium through the epicardium, in other words, from deep to superficial, you will not have a regrowth. So, so we have this analogy of the neuron, and the effector, of course, will be the heart. So we've seen one neuron, but let's look at this. What happens when we have a mesh of computers, a mesh of interconnected computers? Well, the word mesh in medicine is plexus. And the plural form is plexi or plexuses. And where do we, where in the world do we see these interconnected mesh of computers? On the internet. A worldwide web, web mesh of interconnected computers. We also see the, see this in the brain. The brain is again a mesh of interconnected neurons. But we also see this in other places of the body, specifically the digestive system. The digestive system within its walls, and I'm not going to go into the detail, there are two plexuses, two ganglionated plexuses within the digestive system. And there is their name. And what is interesting is that the digestive system can work completely separated from the central nervous system. It is autonomous in its way. And some, I, I don't like the term, but I am getting warm up to it. Some call this the second brain, the brain of the gut. And here you have examples of articles. Uh, this is from Scientific American, and how there is a second brain, if you will, within the um, digestive system. Basically, any organ that has rhythmic activity has its own little brain. This is true for the enteric system, for the gut digestive system. It is true for the ureter. Is it true for some arteries? It's true for the urethra, etc. And here you have another paper on the of the little brain in the gut. This is on Neuroforum. And the role of the brain in the gut in controlling water and electrolytes. Well, the fact is that there is the the heart has its own network of neurons. And this is what John Armour, in his book, Neurocardiology, calls the um, little brain. And this is what we're going to talk about um, today in, 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 in more detail. In fact, um, here are some slides from the last year's November presentation where um, you see some of the, actually see some of these plexuses. Here's an, a rendering of a cardiac a ganglion. And in fact, you can even see a cross section. So that, these ganglia, these ganglionated plexi are not figments of imagination. There are thousands of papers written about it. And we did talk about the history of this. They were discovered in the 1800s. So, uh, Dr. Miranda, uh, yes. in summary, you're saying that certain parts of our body have our own little brains. Yes. You mentioned uh, the digestive tract, so that's the uh, stomach and the intestines, as you showed on one of your slides. Uh, you're, you're going to mention the heart is one. You told me uh, in the kidney system or the... Uh, the ure ureters, you mentioned that, that's the drainage part of the kidney. So those yeah. are three that have their own sort of little autonomous action without, 
it can be modulated by the brain, but without the brain, it'll still work. Yes, and you can, and this is proven when you have cases, terrible cases of decerebration, where after an accident, the person is, the brain is disconnected, and yet the body keeps on working. So um, there are a couple clinical points here. One, you you showed the slide that. Um, the ablation, if it goes all the way through, could affect the ganglion. Yeah. Yeah. But you mentioned in a prior lecture that the majority of the ganglionic plexi, I think you said 80%, are near the Correct. outside of the heart, not the inside of the heart. Correct. Which could explain that, why it's difficult to get a good clinical success when burning from the inside, also known as catheter ablation. You're absolutely correct. Absolutely correct. And. Um, and this this something needs to be clearly understood that in a, an ablation needs to be transmural. And secondly, it brings up a point. Uh, there's all the rage about the newest way to do catheter ablation with a new ablation device that's much faster. And it was hoped that it would be much more effective. However, a pulse field ablation, PFA, has shown yeah. in midterm results to be mm -hmm. no better than radio frequency as far as keeping people out of AFib. Based on what you show me on the anatomy, that makes sense because they're touting that the PFA doesn't destroy the, the nerves. And Correct. if you don't get the nerves, you don't get the ganglionic plexi. If you don't Correct. get the ganglionic plexi, you haven't mm -hmm. altered the milieu of the AFib stimuli. Yep, okay. absolutely correct. All right, okay. Um, let's see, so, carry on. Okay, um, all right. So the, the question is, where are these ganglionic, ganglionated plexi? And they are found, as you said, on the surface of the heart, on the outside of the heart, 80%, 20% are, are deeper. And they're found in the areas where there is fat in the heart. And as you can see in this sketch, around the, the pulmonary veins and between the pulmonary vein and the superior and the inferior cable. So, and again, this is part of the uh, earlier presentation in, in November. So this is an add-on to that. Now, in his book, the Neurocardiology, this is one of two books. This is a smaller one. Then I, I can show you the, the big one. <laughs> um, Armour and his uh, research group shows an incredibly complex system, and we're not going to study this one. I think we should go and simplify this. So... Um, that's what I want, I want to do next, but I do not know if you have any uh, other uh, questions that you would like to answer. Let me just throw in a few um, questions that are up on the board, Dr. Miranda, if you don't okay. mind, just so we no don't problem. get too far behind. And again, we're going to show how to join us. If you're on your phone, go to 37607 and then text DeBakey and you can ask us a question. Uh, for me or for Dr. Miranda, or if you're on your computer, uh, you go to poll, P-O-L-L-E-V dot com, enter DeBakey and ask a question. Can your EKG look a bit different after the Wolf Mini Maze, even though you are in normal sinus rhythm? Yes, for several reasons. One is there's always some inflammation after any procedure, whether it's a cut on your skin or a mini maze, anything, you're going to have some inflammation. And this will alter the EKG, specifically make the ST segments elevated. It can be confused with some myocardial ischemia, but it's simply inflammation of, of, the, of the heart. Uh, there can also be uh, changes in the, in the conduction for a while where the QRS may widen. So, and that has no clinical significance. Can a CT scan, new question, can a CT scan be done without contrast? Well, yes, of course it can, but it will not give us the most important information, which is, is there any blood clot in the left atrial appendage? 
By the way, I forgot to mention, that's another great lecture that Dr. Miranda gave on the left atrial appendage some time ago. One of the best lectures he's ever given, and I think it's because I only gave him 45 minutes notice, so he couldn't mess around. <laughs> but anyway, uh, the only way to see the left atrial appendage clearly is to give contrast. And we um, wrote a paper on this uh, 20 years ago when I was at the University of Cincinnati. If you do a delayed image, you'll see the slow filling of the left atrial appendage. And this specific way of doing the CT scan is the way I've instructed our people to do the CT scan here. So if you have your CT scan before you come to Houston, most likely they won't use the protocol that we use and they will miss a slow filling left atrial appendage and call it a clot. But it's not a clot usually. It's just slow filling appendage, particularly if the heart's in atrial fibrillation at the time of the CT scan. It's okay if the heart's in AFib, but you have to do the right CT scan to catch that. Uh, my EP says he's seen patients after having a procedure where the left atrial appendage was not closed completely with atrial clip or a stub was created at the bottom. Well, you know, I don't have control over all the EPs and all the readings around the country or the people that put on the atrial clip. I think we can say with a lot of confidence, if the clip is put on properly, the appendage is closed. Now, there, there isn't, there is, and uh, Dr. Miranda knows more about this anatomy than I do, but there is some space normally maybe between what you think is the inside of the atrium and the left atrial appendage. <clears throat> There's sort of a transition zone. Sometimes that's confused on the, uh, on the echo. Uh, and also, uh, the clip has to be put on the right way. I mean, the clip has to be put on at the base of the appendage. So there can be a technical error, not putting it on correctly. But once it's put on, it doesn't move, it doesn't shift, and it's 100% occlusive, and more importantly, compared to the Watchman device, it electrically isolates the appendage. The study's been done, uh, Dr. Miranda might have been involved, I'm not sure, where they looked at appendages six, appendages six weeks after they were placed in an animal model, and the appendage had just shriveled down to a little nub, and it was completely electrically silent. The Watchman device does not create electrical silence in the appendage, and I think that's a problem, because you want it to be quiescent. So the clip has to be put on properly. If it's put on properly, uh, there won't be any appendage left. Uh, I can't find a surgeon who performs anything like your procedure. Can I consider closure of the left atrial appendage only? Oh, yes, you can, <clears throat> and that's done in certain centers, but keep in mind, once that's done, that precludes going back to do the whole mini maze. So I have tr been trying to ask or trying to convince surgeons if they close the appendage, at least go around the veins on the left and isolate the veins. So these areas that Dr. Miranda is showing you anatomically <clears throat> are closed and the GPs are changed. So uh, if the left atrial appendage is closed, and the GPs aren't treated, and the, uh, and the veins on the left aren't properly treated. We can't go back and do it at a later date. There'd be too much scar. Yep. Uh, I think we'll stop there and go back. That gave you a little, right. little break, uh, Dr. Miranda. And I know you left us with this complicated chart, and you're going yep. to try to simplify that for us, right? Well, in in a way. <laughs> so here we are. Uh, let me see. That's what we have. And then um, let's do and understand that this is um, just schematic. So here on one side of the screen, we have the heart. Within the heart, we have the conduction system. And this, I've said it several times, the conduction system of the heart you know, the SA no, the AV no, the bundle of Bachman, um, bundle branches, et cetera, et cetera. These are not nerves. These are cardiomyocytes. These are cardiac muscle cells. 
they do work on their own. They beat on their own. And the heart is happy to beat at 60 beats per minute or whatever its, it's intrinsic conductor system works at. But we do have neurons. We do have nerves. We have the GPs. Now, the GPs have interneurons. They connect. It's a mesh. And they start processing information. And that, so there is a there is processing information within the GPs, communication with the conduction system in both ways. So you can see how this is starting to make a biofeedback system. Now, if we add the humoral system, and let me define that, it's any chemical that comes with the blood or in the blood to the heart. Now we have here a very complex system, which is chemical and electrical. And this would be, for example, what is a transplanted heart. A transplanted heart, when you transplant heart, you transplant its conduction system, its little brain, if you will, and that heart will respond to um, medicine. And we'll discuss what, what's there. Uh, um, yeah. Chemicals in general, mm, hormones. Mm. So I don't know if you want to add something here, because this is a typical transplanted heart disconnected from the rest of the body and it works great i'd like to emphasize two very important important <clears throat> points that you've made number one our own pacemaker cells are not nerves they're modified muscle fibers but the ganglionic plexi are nerves that's okay. point number one and the other point i'd like to make is when uh, give a practical example of humoral control we always ask patients, is your, is your thyroid normal? Because we know that if the thyroid is, produce, is overproductive, that that can stimulate the heart and can cause AFib. So if the thyroid's overactive, that has to be corrected by the endocrinologist before we ever start to treat AFib on the heart. Because if the humoral part is corrected, maybe the AFib would go away. That is true. Okay. That is absolutely true. Go ahead. So, so if we add the humoral, if you just talk about glands like the thyroid, well, the thyroid has control or is controlled by the hypothesis, the hypothalamus, and parts of the brain. So you start seeing how now there is a humoral gland uh, hormone control by the brain, and also all the chemicals that we're ingesting, medicine, coffee, um, alcohol, you name it. But this, we have not, we have yet to enter into the autonomic nervous system, which is composed of this, of um, structures within the brain, within the um, spinal cord, and the um, sympathetic chain. If we add this, we have the sympathetic, which a portion which is um, an activator. And in green here, we have the parasympathetic, which is a depressor. And we have the extrinsic cardiac ganglia. We need to look at the, that the main component of the parasympathetic system is the vagus nerve. And here we need to start um, the vagus nerve is about 80 to 90% sensory. So I'm missing here a, a, an arrow because the, the, the vagus nerve has part motor functions, but mostly sensory functions. And this is the main nerve that is parasympathetic. In fact, it is so long that extends from the base of the brain all the way down to the colon, because it wanders, uh, it, because it wanders around the body, it's called the vagus, from which the word vagabond comes. 
because it's so 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 long and here's a, a in in it's not easy to see this image here but here's some here are some of the functions uh, you see related to with deglutition with swallowing related to control of the larynx related to control of the pharynx this is the motor portion if we look at the the lower portion you see how the vagus extends to all the small intestine and to the colon almost all the way to the sigmoid not shown here uh can i just uh sure. interrupt for a second sure um <clears throat> so when people say they have vago afib now for those listening you can see what that comes from but vago afib is part of the autonomic problem it's not the whole problem so you say you have vago afib i agree with that but vago afib is more than just the vagal nerve absolutely the other thing yeah. is this a little history in the 1970s 80s a lot of people were treated surgically for ulcers and the original operation was to cut the acid secreting part of the stomach out to stop the stomach ulcers and then it became clear that if you interrupted certain branches of the vagus nerve you would stop the acid production or acid overproduction of the stomach so that was a very popular surgical procedure for many years now we can stop the acid production with medicine so you don't hear about that procedure anymore but at one time that was one of the most common procedures done in the United States as far as operation uh, by general surgeons in the operating rooms around the United States was to cut the branches of the vagus nerve that went to the stomach to decrease acid production so the vagus nerve is very influential in the areas that it innervates and one of them is the heart what's interesting if you look <clears throat> carefully all these organs are viscera are internal organs but yeah and, explain what viscera is a viscera is an organ that's contained within one of the body cavities and they work on their own we we cannot control them up to a point um <clears throat> i cannot say uh could you please uh contract the second portion of your duodenum you can't yet it's working and it's all this visceral control from the vagus and the sympathetic chain look at the heart here, here you see a vagus and here you see a nerve turning around the recurrent laryngeal nerve we talk because of the recurrent laryngeal nerve um and here you see how they start forming plexuses and these are the extra cardiac plexuses mm -hmm. so look at how it's starting to come together we have the conduction system of heart controlled by the gps giving information here to the extrinsic cardiac ganglia just mentioned all this information going through the vagus nerve to the brain back through here it, it, it it's just absolutely incredible how complicated this is and yet how easily it can go haywire well it's a very redundant system absolutely it's a very redundant system for a reason i think because a long time ago you had to be able to run away from a tiger very quickly so yes. your brain said get going right now and the redundancy of the system ensures rapid reaction time today i think it may be the stress of of road rage and being on the inter, interstate that may throw the system out of whack it could be stress could be other things but i think you're going to get to that because i remember you were asking people what their triggers were uh, oh, for yeah. afib and it's all over the place but i guess you'll get to that in a minute but my yep. my take home point here with your computer analogy is it's a it's a system with a lot of redundancies yep redundancies and uh, biofeedback and feedback loops so in fact in fact it was recently discovered that the extrinsic cardiac ganglia have interneurons so although we do have the little brain of the heart here 
these also have some um, activity. In fact, and I will mention it in a few minutes, again, it has been found that the extrinsic cardiac ganglia and the GPs do have short-term memory capabilities. Uh, it, it's just mind-boggling. So, this is from <clears throat> textual, if you will, from armor. This is exactly what I'm saying. These neurons can process information independent, so the heart can the heart can work on its own. But the extrinsic cardiac ganglia and the GPs also work together, and. This leads to a lot of other stuff that I don't want to go in right now. But here's the situation. Now, let's add something incredibly important. The prefrontal cortex, the forebrain, the, 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 the brain itself. Can we affect the GPs on the conduction? Absolutely. How many times have we been absolutely stressed because we have a test? Uh, we're going to see a doctor, we're going to go for an operation, uh, or we see a road rage, and what happens? The glands prepare for fight or flight, heart activation. The vagus nerve gets ready, the sympathetics get ready, and the, the, the whole system goes into a stress. So we ourselves are responsible in, in because of our thought processes and our interaction for our heart health. In fact, there is a condition where you can, if you are submitted to a tremendous stress, you can die or you can have what's known as the broken heart syndrome, the Takotsubo cardiomyopathy. And I don't know if you want to talk about this, but this is... This is how the heart looks, and and that's a the shape of a Japanese um, octopus trap. It's it's incredible. As I said, we ourselves, sorry, we ourselves can cause our own problems. And if we add the rest of the system, the digestive system has its own GPs. Do they communicate with the heart? Can our digestive system trigger atrial fibrillation? Absolutely. How? It could. The brain communicates with the digestive system, digestive system back, and through these communications, back to the heart and back here. Well, so, uh, uh, Efrain, there have been many patients who told me that once they had the mini maze and their heart settled down, their digestive problems also settled down. There you go. <clears throat> uh, it, let me it's, it's uh, just put in a couple questions here. Uh, one is for you. Can the ganglionic plexi grow back after being ablated? Uh, the answer is no. Okay. No. Um, if the ablation was properly made, it will not. Because number one, if you if you ablate the body of the of the neurons, those are not going to come back. If you ablate the uh, the axons, the nerves, the connector, if you will, if it's done properly with a good scar tissue, they will not grow back. Okay. Can there be minute? little connections are left over and they grow back? Probably, but it's minute, minimal. But uh, as, as I mentioned earlier, pulse field ablation boasts that it doesn't injure the nerves. Yep. That could be a bad thing. <coughs> could be. Um, go ahead. All right, so this is... Um, this, when I started looking at all of this, I started looking at the AFib triggers. What can trigger the system? What can trigger atrial fibrillation or any 
arrhythmia or dysrhythmia for that matter. And I, uh, with the help of uh, Sandy and the Wolf Minimax group, I asked them, what are your triggers? And here's the answer. Now, keep in mind this whole sketch, this whole system, and we're going to keep them here up here. We're going to keep it here so you can start looking at it. And the first one is unknown, also known as idiopathic. And the fact is, there are many reasons. There's a lot of people who answer, I have no idea why or how or what was my trigger. And usually that could be really an imbalance in this in the system here. Or maybe the individual, the patient, did not recognize what was the, that particular problem. So the second one is body habitus and emotional. And these are the really the, <clears throat> the big ones. <clears throat> Sorry, excitement, stress. I don't want to read all of this, but fatigue, lack of sleep. The next one <clears throat> is environmental. Extreme temperature temperature changes. <coughs> I even had a case where there's <coughs> sorry people who get in a pool and start with aphid. The next one, positional, <coughs> lying on the left side, reclining. Some people have this. Um, I'm not going to go through all of these. Would lift a hand, put the hand down, lift the other one, lift the other one, bam. That's proprioception. That's self <clears throat> positioning. Um, someone, someone said that if they 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 were rotated, you know how you sometimes just want to get turned around. Hmm? Some people have it. In the morning, sometimes a bowel movement can trigger it. Digestive. Um, circadian. Some reported that around 4 a.m. they're sleeping, there seems to be nothing wrong, bam. Or others will say, I can't lay down after 4 p.m. because if I do that, I will trigger AFib. Medication and pathologies. A lot of responses, didn't you? Oh, I got over a hundred. Yeah. But uh, this is interesting, and I know we talked about this. Yeah. You you want to talk about the first one? <laughs> uh, which is the first one? Oh, COVID. Yes. Um, uh, we had a few patients that had their mini maze. 10 years ago, 14 years ago, and they got the vaccine or they got COVID and the next day they got AFib. So, uh, yeah, I, I don't think it's just um, by chance. Uh, I think well, there's a real connection between that mm -hmm. marked inflammation of the heart, inflammation of the myocytes, the cells of the heart, which we know can happen with COVID and uh, AFib. I think it's, I think it's real. Uh, oh, let me, he's, he's, can, oh, can I throw in a couple questions here sure. uh, mm -hmm. before we get too far off of them? <clears throat> can a not yet biopsied thyroid nodule or two in my case cause AFib when the blood tests are normal for thyroid function? My short answer would be no. That, that suggests those thyroid nodules are not functioning uh, if the thyroid levels are normal. So that shouldn't really be affecting the AFib. Another one, I have friends who are five years into asymptomatic AFib. How long does it take for the left atrium to enlarge to the point that you won't operate? My general rule is if the left atrium is less than six centimeters, hmm, you okay, less than six centimeters, or uh, if the patient has been in rhythm in the last few years, that the mini maze will still work. Once the left atrium gets over six centimeters, uh, and the heart's been and the heart's been out of rhythm for many years. The chances of it working starting start going down, but it's not 
zero, it just starts to go down. Uh, we've had patients that have had large left atrium, but they've been in rhythm in the last few years and they do fine. And that's best uh, to see on a CT scan or an echocardiogram where they just rub the gel on your chest. So we don't know how long it takes. It really depends on how long the heart has been continuously out of rhythm. If the heart is in and out of rhythm for five years, but it's not continuously out of rhythm, that's fine. The question is how long has it been continuously out of rhythm? And once you get over five years, then that left atrium starts to uh, enlarge significantly. I have a friend who's had three catheter ablations, still is in AFib, imagine that. Uh, during one of the ablations, a blood clot was caused in the left atrial appendage. Once the clot was caused, the cardiologist refused to clamp the LAA. Does he have options? Absolutely. Uh, most clots, if they're really there, will dissolve over time with anticoagulation. Sometimes clots uh, are seen on echo and they're not really clots. That's called a false positive where the cardiologist says you have a clot in your appendage based on the echo, but in fact, you don't have it. Uh, what I've found over the years is the CT scan is the winner. You get a CT scan with contrast with delayed images, as I mentioned earlier, and that will definitively rule out a, uh, a clot in the left atrial appendage much more accurate uh, than getting an echocardiogram. So yes, uh, you need to get a CT scan and find out. Uh, does Dr. Otsuka, now this is a question about one of my former fellows who has a thriving AFib practice in Tokyo. <clears throat> he does it very well. Uh, does he do, follow the same testing CT scan criteria for Wolf Mini Maze? I think he does. The last time I was there was Cherry Blossom Festival last year, and they have a CT scanner there, and I believe he does. Uh, but I don't want to say for sure. Uh, I'll ask him that. Uh, I think he does. Uh, let's see. Uh, I think we'll stop there. Uh, Efrain, uh, back yep. to you. We got maybe um, five or ten more minutes. Is that okay? Is that enough time for you? I have I have probably two more minutes. <laughs> okay. We're really, we're really in. Okay. But there's something which is interesting to me uh, here is that there's several uh, answer several patients who were reported having gastroesophageal reflux disease as a trigger. And what's interesting to me is that when you have gastroesophageal reflux disease, you reflux acid. The acid has fumes, and you can aspirate those fumes and irritate your lungs. And the irritation is your trigger. If you if we go back here, that would explain also chlorine gases because it's an irritation of the lungs. And who what is the main nerve to the lungs? The vagus nerve. So here we go. Now uh, I know that there are some medications that will trigger uh, AFib. I only have two here, but it's there's probably more than that. What is interesting is that all the triggers are almost individual. And the digestive system on foods is probably the biggest group. Caffeine, overeating, carbohydrates, caffeine, alcohol, big one. Um, someone even said that person can, he cannot eat tomatoes. But what was interesting to me is the uh, tyramine hypersensitivity. So there's a whole group of foods that are rich in tyramine, and these are the, the biggest group of triggers. So in the end, this is what I wanted to cover. The complexity of the system, the feedback, and in the end, the question is, what does the Minimase do? And it does three things. Number one, you see this uh, dark line here. <clears throat> You're 
reducing. You're not eliminated completely. You're reducing the amount of communication between the heart and the extrinsic cardiac ganglia and the nervous, the autonomic nervous system in general. But this is not total. You're just quieting, putting the heart in a little bit more quiescence. The second thing is that they're the by the same token. You're reducing the amount of communication between the GPs, which may be hyperactive, and the conduction system of the heart. So the heart now is can rest more, it's more quiet. And the third and most important thing is the elimination of the left atrial appendage. And these are the three main components of a good ablation of the heart, of the uh, autonomous. And I think that's my last slide, and I'm going to leave this one here um, because I think this is where you can comment on your procedure. Well, I, I think what if we want to look at the big picture, what we're trying to say is AFib is a nerve problem. Uh -huh. uh, there are lots of different factors involved, but ultimately it's a nerve problem. And as you've pointed out, most of the nerves of the heart are on the outside of the heart, not the inside. So if you want to have a successful program, ablation program, I think it has to include something that affects the outside of the heart. And this would explain why catheter ablations are not so easy to do and it's hard to get a good outcome because you're starting from the inside where there are virtually no ganglionic plexi and you're trying mm -hmm. to penetrate the heart muscle and get all the way to the outside to, to treat the nerves but not enough to make a hole in the heart because that would be catastrophic. It does happen not very often. And you have to have something that will affect the nerves. So if you have a device that doesn't injure the nerves, maybe that's not a good thing because you do have to do something to the nerves to decrease, as you say, this tremendous amount of information that's coming in from everywhere. Uh, so that's why it's how it's clinically, that's, that's how I think you get from the anatomy to the clinical situation and would explain why a therapy such as the mini maze, which targets specifically the nerves and the outside of the heart, would be successful. Now, it's, is it 100% successful? No, nothing is. But it's 100% more successful than a catheter ablation, and that's with a one-and-done procedure. So to me, your explanations make sense of why a certain procedure may or may not work. And I still believe strongly that any therapy that doesn't include epicardial treatment or the outside of the heart treatment is going to have a lot higher failure rate. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, to, the interesting thing to me was to learn from you that it's not only the heart that has these little brains. You yep. mentioned the <laughs> intestine, you mentioned the ureter, and I think there's going to be more and more emphasis on this. We're already seeing companies are getting interested in ablating the pulmonary arteries to stop pulmonary hypertension. Uh, we're seeing companies are getting interested uh, in ablating the renal arteries or veins to decrease renal hypertension. So I think there is starting to become a little a bit of a renaissance on what's important in some of these organs. It's been pretty much um, ignored for the last 50 years. All right. Yep. Um, Let's see. Um, we got through. There are a couple questions, but they aren't complete. I can't really answer them because they kind of fade off. They didn't get. I guess they didn't get their point across in the number of words that you have to to use. I want to thank everybody for joining us. Uh, it's been uh, a pleasure to have all of you with us. Thank you for the great questions, uh, Dr. Miranda. Thank you for joining us. Uh, I know you've got a lecture next week. I didn't mention you're also a uh, anatomic historian. You got a lecture next week at the University of Cincinnati on Vesalius and large images, uh, which is interesting lecture for anybody that's in the Cincinnati area. You should catch this lecture. Uh, I heard a similar lecture that you gave 
was it last year? In, yeah, uh, June. In, in Europe. And uh, that was a great, uh, in Antwerp. Uh, and yep. that was a great lecture. So if any of you are coming from Cincinnati area, uh, go to uh, Efrain's website, and maybe it's up there. Maybe that uh, lecture will be posted. Uh, we will convene again uh, in a month, first Tuesday of the month, 5 p.m. Central Time. I want to thank one of my producers, Tyree Horn, for feeding me warm water and, and other things to keep me from coughing through the through the meeting. You didn't have anybody to help you, did you? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you, Tyree. Uh, and hope everybody has a good rest of the week and uh, has, a, has fun viewing the, uh, the total eclipse that's, that's coming up. Uh, it's yep, going to pass great. through Texas and close to Cincinnati as well. Uh, until, if you have any questions, go to the Wolf Mini Maze website, which we'll put up on the screen here. Also, go to clinicalanatomy.com for some interesting uh, comments. And the, the uh, Wolf Mini Maze website is a way to reach me if you're interested in more information on treating your AFib. So thanks, everybody. Uh, Dr. Miranda, thank you so much for taking time Pleasure. out to put this together. And we'll see you all again in about a month. So long from Houston, Texas. And from Cincinnati.